Okay, we will start the session now. Uh, my name is Charles Fritz Pedersen. Uh, I'm a, a professor at the TTU Wind Energy at the MESS uh, section. And I'll be the chairman of this session, which is the defense of Antoine Borasino's PhD uh, dissertation. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to welcome the uh, assessment committee sitting here in front. Uh, the, the first examiner will be Andy Clifton. Uh, Andy is the managing director of uh, the Southern German uh, Wind Energy Cluster, Windforce, and this is uh, covering seven universities in the Southern uh, Germany. And prior to joining uh, Windforce, uh, he was a senior engineer and group leader at Enro in USA from 2012 to 2017. And he, uh, he was responsible for wind and solar source characterization. He gained, his, he gained his PhD from ETH in Zurich in 2007. Welcome here to RISA. Uh, the second uh, examiner is Julia Gottschall from uh, Fraunhofer Institute for Wind Energy and Energy System Technique. Uh, Julia is a senior scientist with focus on measurements and evaluation of wind conditions for utilization in wind energy. And Julia gained her PhD from Oldenburg University in 2009. And she worked as a, a scientist at Research DTU from 2009 to 2011. Welcome back to Risa. <laughs> uh, the third examiner is uh, Kurt S. Hansen, uh, sitting here. He is a long-term long -term senior uh, research scientist in the department, uh, and he is in the fluid mechanics section. Kurt has been here for 40 years and uh, is uh, quite experienced. Uh, his uh, focus areas are wind farm flow and turbulence analysis. So welcome, Kurt. <clears throat> and a warm welcome to Antoine Borsino. You are from TTU Wind Energy, uh, also the MESS section. Antoine has for the last three years been working on his PhD project here at the TTU. And, um, also, a uh, warm welcome to the audience here uh, who has decided to take part in, in this event. Welcome to you in here, but also welcome to those who are sitting remotely uh, to follow your presentation. This is why I have this uh, microphone on <clears throat> and they will be able to see the um, slides. Today, Antoine will defend his PhD dissertation. The title of his speech is uh, Remotely Measuring the Wind Using Turbine Mounted LIDARs, Application to Power Performance Testing. And uh, this title is the same as the title of uh, your dissertation. The subject of his PhD study uh, is, as the title says, uh, analysis of how we can apply an cellar mounted lighters to measurements and detection of the incoming wind field. This analysis includes uh, methods for traceable calibration and uncertainty estimates. This is a subject that uh, points towards the future method of power performance measurements. Antoine has uh, prepared his PhD dissertation at the PhD School of DTU, Wind Energy. He has followed the PhD program in the department and he started in May 2014 and he submitted his dissertation in June 2017. During his study, he made a, an external stay for 16 weeks at uh, Stuttgart University at the Institute for Aeronautics from January 2016 to May 2016. 
and uh, he, has, he has made two scientific articles. <clears throat> Antoine's uh, main supervisor was Mike Courtney. Uh, he's also from uh, DTU, uh, Wind Energy, the max, mess section. Uh, Mike Courtney is a senior researcher and he has supervised Antoine uh, during the whole PhD study. Antoine also had a co-supervisor and it was uh, Rosanne Wagner uh, sitting down there. She is also from the mess section at DTU and she is a senior researcher and she has also supervised Antoine in the whole period. Uh, this defense may take uh, no more than three hours in total and 45 minutes are for uh, Antoine for his presentation. Uh, after the presentation, uh, the examiners uh, will ask questions and when they have finished their questions, then uh, the uh, supervisors are allowed to uh, put questions and after that, uh, then people from the audience are allowed to ask questions and those questions may, with answers may last for a maximum of 15 minutes and the questions from the audience have to be announced now so are there any questions from the audience? No, there will be no questions from the audience so uh, now I'll give the word to you, Antoine. You will have 45 minutes. So I guess the time, is uh, the time starts now. So welcome everybody and good afternoon. So as Troll said, I've been working for three years uh, with Michael Courtney and Rosen Weiner on my PhD project as supervisors. And I have a story to tell you about uh, how the wind can be measured uh, using uh, the cellular lidars uh, mounted on a turbine to remotely send the wind and um, for the purpose of power performance testing. The outline of the defense will be the following. Uh, first, an introduction to the different relevant topics uh, that will be in my presentation. Then we will talk about the calibration of wind lidars and this is an important part of my PhD since it allows to have uh, traceable measurements and quantify uncertainties of wind lidars measurements. The third part is the wind field reconstruction because we need to uh, get useful information out of the raw measurements of a LiDAR and we need uh, dedicated techniques for that. And the last part is the application of all these methods to the power performance testing. So let's start with the introduction. And first the motivations. This is the CO2 curve over the last two, three uh, centuries and uh, yeah. There is a human factor apparently happening around the 1900 uh, year. So this is causing of environmental issues and we don't really want that anymore, but also that actually. Instead, we tend to prefer to have, for example, wind turbines and wind farms offshore, onshore. But it's not only an environmental question. If you put such wind turbines out there, they would not exist if the wind industry was not making money. There is a huge industry behind uh, wind energy and needs to make money uh, so that we can actually achieve such big uh, projects. So, fine, money, but uh, how does the wind industry ensure it makes money? Well, one part of, of, of that answer is, uh, is, is this very simple equation where you take uh, the wind resource in the first step, which tells you how much wind there is at a specific uh, location. You add uh, the power curve of wind turbine and the power curve of wind turbines tells uh, how much a wind turbine produces depending on different atmospheric conditions. And when you combine both of these, you get the annual energy production. And this is important because you will decide how much, that will tell you how much energy the wind farm and the wind turbines will produce every year and you can convert that into, into money. And my focus is the power curve measurement of wind turbines so the wind resource in the first part is a very uncertain estimate. We, it's hard to predict, uh, to forecast the long-term wind resource. 
the power curve application is, uh, uh, the power curve itself is guaranteed by the turbine manufacturers and that is the object of uh, contractual agreements and also implementing the, the method to do that to measure a power curve is implemented in international standards. And combining those, we get uh, annual energy production. It's important basis for having bankable wind projects. That's the very first part. And what is about what is perf performance testing? One of the first goals of power performance testing is to relate the turbine power to the energy available in the wind, and that is usually done through the proxy of wind speed. And we need measurements for that. We need measurements of the turbine power and of the so-called free stream wind speed. That is defined as the wind speed at the turbine position as, is it, as if the turbine was not there. The second goal of power performance testing is the assessment of the power curve uncertainties, which basically aims at answering the question of how far from the true power curve uh, is the measured power curve. And the true power curve is unmeasurable. And with the assessment of uncertainties, we can basically say that the wheel turbine will be able to produce uh, that much energy every year, plus minus uh, some, some value that is defined by the uncertainties, and we can say that with a certain uh, probability. So that's the purpose of power performance testing, and now how do we do that? The old way, uh, the old way is to use meteorology masts and that are placed uh, far enough away from the turbine, two to four auto diameters, and on these masts we mount uh, copper generators or stonic animators, classic uh, animatory techniques. That is the old way. That's been working pretty fine for 30 years, but it's not really uh, working that, that well anymore. The modern way is to use remote sensing instruments. Uh, actually, here you have uh, the picture of a DEFERS uh, 300 LiDAR on the left and of a wind cube LiDAR on the right side. And the use of ground-based profiling LiDARs is actually allowed in the IEC standards for power performance testing. The modern way version two is to use nacelle mounted wind LiDARs. That is wind LiDARs mounted on the turbine nacelle. And this is uh, now and already being used in the future. It's not already in the standard. Hopefully it will be in the next generation. And here you have four examples of such uh, nacelle mounted LiDAR systems. So what is the benefit of using nacelle LiDARs for power performance testing? For multi-megawatt turbines that are pretty huge, the first, uh, first benefit is the cost efficiency. Ground-based LiDARs and nacelle LiDARs are more cost efficient than a meteorology mast. The second benefit is the representativity of the wind measurement. Uh, nacelle LiDARs provide more representative wind measurements than a MET mast and than a ground-based LiDAR. And by representativity, we mean something that is uh, more consistent, uh, correlated to what the turbine feels. Uh, the wind that is measured by a nacelle LiDAR is more uh, related quality to the turbine power than others instruments. And these two benefits, they are true, but they are particularly true offshore for the cost efficiency of uh, nacelle-based LiDARs. And ground-based and nacelle-based LiDARs, they probably compete very much onshore, and they are giving more representative measurements than a MET-MAS because I'm able to measure at multiple heights at the same time. So. I've been using a word quite a few times now, LIDAR, and probably some of you don't know what that is. So LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging, and this is basically a radar using light instead of radio waves. A LIDAR allows for remotely measure the wind, and it can be from some meters away from the system to uh, 10 kilometers plus nowadays, depending on the technologies. The basic principles of current uh, Doppler wind LIDARs are as follow. Um, you first have backscattered light that is basically returned return light that is coming from particles moving with the air. And the uh, light that is returned to the LiDAR system is uh, frequency sh shifted, Doppler frequency shifted, and that is the Doppler effect. So the backscattered light signal is processed using uh, fast Fourier transforms, and that gives us the Doppler spectrum. This is an example here. This Doppler spectrum, spectrum is nice, but you're not really interested in that directly. You then estimate out of the Doppler spectrum the line of sight velocity. That is the projection of the wind vector onto the laser beam propagation path. And once you have line of sight velocity measurements, 
as you can see here in the Fabian demonstrator and the deferred dual mode, you need to combine line of sight resistivity measurements in multiple locations or from multiple systems to estimate wind field characteristics. And wind field characteristics are parameters that give us useful information on the wind flow. That can be, for instance, wind speed, wind direction, shear, and other type of wind parameters. All right. Um, so with that introduction, now we have to look at the research question that I touched during my PhD. The first question is to quantify the uncertainties of LiDAR measurements, and uh, especially uh, for nascent mounted LiDARs. And to quantify uncertainties, we need calibration procedures. So I've written an article and published an article in a remote sensing journal that you can see here with Mike and Rosanna uh, co-authors. And the second research question is how can nascent mounted LIDARs provide free stream, free field wind characteristics that are suitable for power curve measurement? And that is, uh, a need, there was a need to develop new wind field reconstruction methodologies. Again, another article that has been published uh, on that topic in Wind Energy Science. Uh, and that was um, the result of work that has been conducted in Stuttgart with David Schlipp and Florian Eitzmann uh, during my external stay. And the last, last uh, point is to test these methods of wind field reconstruction and, and confirm or not if they are working for power performance testing. So second part is the calibration of wind lidars. And here we're gonna touch uh, the methodologies that I've developed uh, in my PhD. And the end uh, result, the goal is really to get to the point of lidar uh, measurement uncertainties. But a lidar is a measuring system and the calibration is actually a very defined term uh, in the science of measurement, metrology. There are international standards issued by different bodies. And uh, the two main ones, in my opinion, are the VIM, which, is, which gives the vocabulary of metrology. And the second one is the GAM, the Guide to Uncertainty in Measurements. According to those documents, the calibration is an operation providing three things. The first thing is a relation between measured values and reference quantity values. And this relationship can be a mathematical model, can be a curve, can be a table, can be different, can take different forms. The second part of the calibration is to associate measurement uncertainties with, uh, with the measurement of the system you want to calibrate. And the last part is to apply a correction to the measured indicated quantity value so that you get the best estimate out of your uh, uh, basic first measurement, non calibrated measurement. And why do we bother? Um, we bother because we want our measurements retraceable to the international system of units and want to quantify uncertainties, as I've just said. The true value of a quantity, let's say wind speed, is unknowable, basically cannot be uh, known with a 100% certainty. And measurement values are actually meaningless if you don't specify uncertainty because you won't know uh, to, uh, with which accuracy your measurement has been measured. So how can you calibrate wind lidars? Um, for nacelle wind lidars, uh, we have identified two uh, different uh, methodologies. The first one is the so-called black box, which is a direct comparison of reconstructed wind parameters. So basically the outputs the LiDAR is seen as a black box and you have outputs, uh, reconstructed wind characteristics, and you don't care about the inputs or what the LiDAR really does inside. You just want to compare the outputs to some reference quantities. The pros of that is that it's uh, very simple. Uh, it doesn't require much knowledge at all. And the cons is that actually the setup of, uh, of such a black box methodology for nacelle LiDARs is uh, completely unrealistic and it would be very LiDAR specific. And actually, it simply doesn't work. Some people have tested the white box with NSL LiDAR systems and it didn't do well at all. The second approach uh, is the white box methodology. And here you calibrate all the inputs of the wind field reconstruction algorithms. And the inputs, so here now we see the LiDAR as a white box. The inputs are the backscatter light, the line side velocities, the LiDAR scanning geometry, et cetera, et cetera. The pros are that you have a low sensitivity to the assumption that you are making later on to reconstruct wind field characteristics. It's a quite a highly generic, generic method, and you can quantify uncertainties on any wind characteristics. 
the cons is that the process of calibrating a LiDAR with a white box is longer and it does require quite some expert knowledge about the systems. And we chose this method because this is the one that can work for NSL LiDAR systems. So the generic calibration methodology that I've been developing in my PhD is based on the original procedures for two beam NSL LiDAR systems. Uh, that was a uh, work started by Michael Courtney in 2013. And I further developed and tested the method with two, beam, uh, two different NSL LiDAR systems that have multiple beams. So on the left side, you have the event five beam demonstrator that has five line of sight. It is a pulse system, it's step staring. So it's taking one line of sight and then the next one and then the next one and measuring at multiple dis distances simultaneously, up to 10 distances. On the right side, you have the Zephyr dual mode that is continuously scanning. Uh, so it's a continuous wave uh, light system and uh, it's conically scanning. So it's measuring at one range and refocusing in the next range uh, at a high speed. And this uh, work I've published in, two, in a journal article and two detailed calibration reports. So the first part of the calibration methodology is the uh, calibration of beam position in quantities. Here we are talking about the in kilometers of the LiDAR system, the tilt and roll, that how it moves and the LiDAR geometry is, can be a parameter such as the cone angle for the Zephyr dual mode or opening angles for the Fabian demonstrator and the geometry allows us to know where the measurement points are taken. So here you see the pictures of that ground testing for the beam positioning quantities and the procedures are LiDAR specific, cannot be avoided. The LiDAR geometry will depend on each system and we use hard target method to detect the beam position in these frames but I won't go too much into detail into this method because, because they are LiDAR specific. The second part and the most important part is the calibration of the line of sight velocity uh, measured by the nacelle LiDARs. So we will use the, this measurement setup in Hofzer in Denmark uh, at the test section uh, for large wind turbines from DTU. And the LiDARs were placed close to this MET mass here, 260 meters from two small mass and that's how it looks when from the back with the Zephyr here and the Fabian demonstrator there. And probably you can't see the two small masts there. If we zoom in, that looks like this. We have two small masts of nine meter uh, separated by five meter. Uh, one is top mounted with a cup animator, the other one with a sonic animator. And we detected the beam position of the five beam here and of the Zephyr, uh, we have the beam passage since it's continuously scanning uh, schematized here. Now with a method to calibrate the line of sight velocity. We need measurements. We have uh, the main data that are coming from the cup animator. We use a cup as a reference wind speed uh, measurement system. The sonic uh, animator was used to uh, retrieve the wind direction. And the LiDAR from the LiDAR, we use the line of sight velocity and the tilt angle from the kilometers. Um, with this data, you can compute the reference quantity that I call the pseudo line of sight velocity, VRF by projecting uh, the horizontal speed in the vertical plane and the first with a tilt angle and in the horizontal plane with the wind direction. However, we're still lacking the line of sight direction here. And this can be evaluated either using high resolution GPS or you can use uh, the data themselves to evaluate the line of sight direction in the coordinate system of the reference wind direction sensor. And that goes with the fitting of the wind direction response, the LiDAR wind direction response. And the second part that is a bit more technical process called residual sum of squares. And the next part of the data analysis is to compare the LiDAR measured line side velocity with the reference quantity we have derived here. The results uh, here are linear regressions on the 10 minute data. So each dot is one 10 minute period. On the left side, you have the Fabian demonstrator with line of sight zero and the bottom part of the scan of the Zephyr dual mode on the right side. And we get a uh, high correlation coefficient, uh, coefficient of determination above 0 0.99. And that's very uh, classic with the experience we have on uh, this method. A site overestimation from the Fabian beam of 0.7% and 0.2% from the Zephyr but the linearity between the LiDAR line of sight velocity and the um, pseudo line of sight velocity from the reference instrument is really high and that is uh, a very consistent result. 
However, it's not a, a calibration relation. The calibration relation is used on the bin data, is the linear regression of the bin data, and that's because the method of bin is actually further used in the power performance testing that we chose that calibration relation. So calibration relation are in green now, and we have obtained our calibration relation. Very good, that's the first part of the calibration. Then we have the uncertainty of, line, of the line side velocity. And the method for that, we use the GUM. And the GUM methodology is uh, based on the law of propagation of uncertainties. It's an analytical method. It needs a measurement model. So here the gain of the calibration relation multiplied by the reference quantity. That gives us Y. And uh, we call the different terms here. And the way you can see the GUM for the line stability calibration, the GUM method, it can, that's what I call the tree of uncertainties. And it goes like this. First, you have the horizontal wind speed, and we need the combined uncertainty of the horizontal wind speed, and use the calibration of the cups, the operational conditions, uh, term, uh, uncertainty term from the operational conditions, the mass mounting, and these two uh, positioning and inclined beam are coming from the calibration process of the LIDAR. Then you also need the uncertainty on the relative direction, that is combining the line of sight direction here and the wind direction theta. And we have the uncertainty on the beam tilt angle. Next stage of the tree, uh, we combine the, this component with uh, the relative direction component with the tilt angle and uh, horizontal speed uncertainty. That gives us the uncertainty on the reference quantity, UCVRF. Next stage, we have the gain of the calibration relation we have obtained uh, in the previous slide. And we can have an uncertainty on, um, on the gain using a half width of the confidence interval uh, using the statistical uh, method. So that gives us UA here, and we have UCVRF. We combine those terms, and we get the uncertainty on the measurement model Y. That is how the process works, and the results of uncertainties with that process. Uh, now we had only in that tree combined uncertainty. When you have the combined uncertainty on Y, you can multiply it by a coverage factor to uh, increase the probability of, uh, of uh, your measurement to fall in that interval. And that gives us what we call expanded uncertainties. So on the black axis, it's actually in meters per second, the uh, expanded uncertainties, and the right axis, it's in the percentage of the line side velocity. And you see the expanded uncertainties as a function of the line side velocity. And the results basically look the same for both systems, and we have a linear relation between the expanded uncertainties and the line of sight velocity. The expanded uncertainty is about 3% at 4 meters per second, uh, and about 2% at 10 meters per second. So here, 2% and 3% on this axis. And this uh, magnitude of uncertainties is actually almost the same as the cup meter that is used as a reference instrument. OK, um, what are the prevailing sources? If it is so close to the cup meter, we might wonder what is happening. Um, actually, when you look at the tree of uncertainties, the contribution of each component to the next level uh, is about 40%, 30%, 24% for the calibration, operational, and mass mounting. So over 90% of the uh, horizontal wind speed uncertainty comes from the cup. At the next stage, 92% uh, of, of the uncertainty on the reference quantity comes from the horizontal wind speed uncertainty. At the next stage, it's 99% uh, for the reference uh, speed, contributing to uncertainty on the measurement model Y. And if we follow that tree, basically we can say that the LiDAR line side velocity uncertainty is almost entirely narrated from the cup animator uncertainty. And that shows us we need to improve uncertainty assessment of cup animators, or maybe we just need uh, new reference sensors. Uh, so, at this stage, we have the uncertainty of our inputs of the wind field reconstruction algorithm, but we don't know how to combine the line side velocities in multiple locations, and that is the purpose of the next part. We are at this stage of the LiDAR measurement chain, and we need uh, methods to retrieve useful uh, information, such as speed, direction, shear. And for that, we need to make assumption of the flow field. The simplest example of wind field reconstruction with nacelle LiDARs is a two-beam nacelle LiDAR systems, where you actually assume horizontal homogeneity, meaning that the, the, wind, the wind speed is the same, uh, and wind speed and direction is the same at a given height. 
And there, are any, there is an analytical solution for the wind speed and for the relative direction with that simple assumption. But this is not a good enough uh, method for profiling NSL lidars where you actually have beams uh, and line measurement points at different heights uh, above the ground. So we need new ones, and that's what I've been uh, doing in my PhD on this part. On top of that, we are still searching for the free stream wind speed. The wind speed at the turbine position of the turbine was not there. Classical method with the mast at 2.5 rotor diameters. The question is if it's really free stream wind speed. For modern turbines, this distance is above 200 meters, up to 400 meters. If you overlay on that, on top of that, that actually the wind speed changes with height. Here you have an example of the power law shear profile. And on top of that, that the turbine has an influence upstream on the flow field due to its operation and uh, the fact that it harnesses energy uh, from the wind. Actually, at 2.5D, you are not really in the free wind. Uh, all the assumption is maybe not good enough. Then you have at such distances the correlation issues between the wind speed uh, at 2.5D and the power of the turbine. And another question is if the hub height wind speed is sufficient to characterize the flow field upstream of the turbine. See the board free stream, uh, does it exist? If you go in an offshore array like here, uh, the flow is disturbed by the turbine wakes, so it's affected by the turbines uh, in the upstream, the one you are looking at. If you go in complex terrain, uh, there's no such thing as a free stream wind speed, unless you can tell me, a, give me a good definition. I don't think it actually exists in those situations at all. So that's a problem we need to address. And I've developed wind model fitting wind field reconstruction techniques. The method itself is not new. It's actually also been studied before David Schlipp uh, in 2012 in his paper you know, for the DEVEC conference. And I've worked uh, with David and Florian in Stuttgart uh, on this. So the model fitting wind, for, wind field reconstruction works uh, as follow. You first have the LIDAR measurements, inclination angles, beam positioning quantities, and you have the line of side velocity measurements. And then you assume, uh, you make assumptions on your flow field, you make a wind model. Then you have a LIDAR model, this is a usually more simple than actually the wind model and you make a guess maybe or not on the initial wind field characteristics values that define your wind model. With that, you go into that box, which is the core of the wind field reconstruction, the model fitting wind field reconstruction. And with this wind model and uh, initial wind field characteristics, you simulate the line of sight velocity in the measurement locations you are interested, you are measuring with the LIDAR. And you compare the simulated line of sight velocities with the one that are actually been measured for real by the LIDAR. And there is an error and you update, you change the wind shield characteristics. And the way you change that is to answer a least square uh, problem. And so it's an optimization and you try to minimize the error between the simulated line of city and the measured one. And it keeps on, it iterates like this until you have converged and you have simulated line of that are close to the measured ones. When they are close enough, uh, you get out of this box and you have the fitted wind field characteristics corresponding to your uh, last iteration. And then if you're interested in looking at different locations with, uh, you want to estimate the wind field at different locations, you decide of the locations and you evaluate the wind field at these locations using the wind model again and the wind field characteristics. And that gives you, for instance, speed and direction at a given point. So we need new wind models for profiling nacelle lidars that are suitable for power performance testing. And I've worked on that very much. The so first wind model, use LiDAR measurements at 2.5 rotor diameters. Uh, you assume stationarity in the sense that you look only at 10 minute data. You don't look at the turbulence within uh, this 10 minute period, the variations of the wind within that 10 minute period. And the assumptions are on the flow field are the horizontal homogeneity and that the uh, wind speed varies with height according to a power law profile. So for instance, you take measurements at 2.5D as, as uh, shown in this graph. And with this wind model, you fit three wind characteristics, the wind speed at hub height, the relative wind direction, and the shear exponent that characterizes the power low profile. All right, that's the first model that uh, I've been using a lot. 
The second model is, uh, is uh, quite innovative, and in it's uh, what I call the combined wind induction model. Now you can use LiDAR measurements at multiple distances close to the router, as you can see here. And at this distance, uh, the wind is actually strongly influenced uh, by the turbine operation. There is a significant wind speed deficit due to the extraction of energy from the wind. The simple, oh, sorry, the simple induction model assumes, uh, is, 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 which is assumed, is coming from the actual disk and the vortex sheet theory. It's not new at all. It's actually uh, probably nearly 100 years old, this simple model. And this model, you have two parameters, uh, that is the free stream wind speed u infinity here in this equation and the induction factor. The rest is a non-dimensional distance and the wind speed at a given distance, u of x. With this model, you can fit four wind field characteristics, the free stream wind speed, u infinity or v infinity at hub height, the relative, relative wind direction, the shear exponent, and also, as I just shown you before, this induction factor that is characterizing our induction. And to test those methods, we needed measurement campaigns. So we had uh, in the Unity project a uh, seven months measurement campaign in Jutland, Denmark, and Jutland is extremely flat. So it's a good reference uh, campaign. The owner is Vattenfall. And uh, the wind farm comprising a row of 13, 13 Siemens turbines of 2.3 megawatts. The LiDARs were placed on turbine four here, and there was a MET mast 2.5 rotor diameters away here. That's the wind rows uh, during this seven months campaign, uh, the distribution of wind speed and wind direction. So the nacelle LiDAR measurement trajectories in these campaigns uh, with the five million demonstrator and the Zephyr dual modes look like this. You had uh, five distances with a Zephyr dual mode, and the first one is just for quality control, so we are only interested in the last four. And uh, it's in red here. The Fabio demonstrator uh, is in blue, and you have 10 distances from 50 meter to 250, something like this. And uh, it has five line of sight. So in the reconstruction, I considered the five line of sight of the Fabian demonstrator and six line of sight of the defer out of this uh, 48 point that you see at each circle. And these six points are in green, uh, so three pairs. Now we can have a look at the uh, comparison between the last cell LiDAR estimates of the wind speed at hub height. So the horizontal wind speed is estimated at hub height uh, and uh, the filtering is made according to the IC free sector. Uh, mentioned here, and uh, also some quality control of the LiDAR data. For the five-beam demonstrators, the uh, LiDAR measurements were taken at two rotor diameters upstream and 2.5 rotor diameters upstream for the DEFRA. And that's how the results look. So we have 2,800 data points, 10 minute periods in these graphs. Five-beam demonstrator on the, on the left side, DEFRA on the right side, as before, and uh, we get pretty consistent coefficient of determination between the, li the LIDARs and the, and the reference cup annuator on the mast. They are really close to each other on these two plots. And the uh, gains are 0.6%, uh, show another estimation of 0.6% by the phi beam and of 0.3%, about 0.3% from the DEFER. The scatter is not, uh, is pretty pretty good. It's, it's not that high, so it's, uh, it's, um, these results seem uh, pretty good and uh, show that the method, uh, the wind model is uh, that we, and the method we have implemented, uh, we're working well with those data. The next slide is about uh, the wind induction model now. So we use uh, the wind induction model, same uh, AC sector, and now we're going to see uh, the horizontal wind speed estimated at hub height and 2.5 rotor diameters upstream, although your LiDAR measurements are only taken closer to the rotor from 0.5 to 1.2 rotor diameters for the phi beam and from 0.3 to 1.2 for the defer at three distances. Again, the results, uh, pretty high uh, correlation of determination, slightly higher than just with the wind model, consistent between the two LiDARs. Uh, almost perfect match of the, of the linear regression, the false linear regression with the phi beam, and a 0.7% under, percent underestimation uh, with the DEFER. And we have a, slow, a lower scatter in these plots uh, with the wind induction model 
that wind, uh, wind model. And you might want to be interested in noticing that actually this is exactly, exactly the same data set time period as in the previous plot. So again, this method is also working uh, pretty nicely. What you haven't seen so far is how the wind evolves in the induction zone. And this is shown here with these dashed lines uh, that represent the wind model, simple wind model, uh, with different induction factors. So a high induction factor is here, a low induction factor is here, and uh, high induction factors are at low wind speed and uh, low induction factors at high wind speed. And the green, green uh, squares, you see the ranges that have been used from the LIDARs. And uh, basically, the LIDAR measurements at each distance with the wind model, estimates of the speed at hub height, have been made non-dimensionalized by the V-infinity characteristics from the wind induction model. So what this shows is that actually the simple induction model is, yes, simple, but it seems adequate enough when you compare what um, the LIDAR measures at each distance to what is the free stream wind speed according to the wind induction model. So where are we now in our white box uh, methodology? We have, we have calibrated the beam positioning quantities, I mean done. We have the calibration of the line side velocities and of the beam position, good. We have wind field reconstruction algorithms that are, uh, seem quite robust. But what we don't have is the uncertainty assessment of the wind field characteristics. And that is important to, to go to that step. So what we need is to propagate the input uncertainty, the line of sight velocity, the inclination angle to the outputs, the wind field characteristics. And this is not really possible with GAM because the models are nonlinear and complex. So instead I use numerical method. Uh, for instance, you can use Monte Carlo simulations. And that allows us to get model uncertainties on all uh, fitted characteristics. A quick word on what uh, Monte Carlo methods are uh, for uncertainty quantification. So Monte Carlo methods are a range of statistical techniques that we can use to computationally solve uh, uh, mathematical problems. The application is numerical integration, optimization, and what we really want here is the quant uncertainty quantification. The principles are that you propagate random inputs. So if you have uh, inputs X, you have their probability density functions. You propagate them through a model and then you obtain distributions of the outputs Y. How you do that is that you uh, make that maybe a million times and you evaluate the model for each of these uh, uh, million time propagation uh, input. So you, you, you pick um, one million values in X, you propagate these one million values in X through the model, and you get one million uh, Y values, and then you just need to characterize the Y values, the Y distributions. So Monte Carlo simulations are quite uh, advanced uh, methods, and I'm just going to show you the results for the free stream wind speed, so it's just with a combined wind induction model here. Uh, on the uh, left side, you have the expanded uncertainty on the V-infinity according to the Monte Carlo simulations as a function of the V-infinity characteristic itself. Uh, uncertainty, expanded uncertainty is on the wind speed, free stream wind speed as a function of the input your misalignment and as a function of the Xi exponent here. What you can see on these plots and that's the same at different speed and different values for uh, shear, uh, your misalignment and speed and induction factors that the wind speed uncertainty varies linearly with the wind speed. It doesn't, uh, it's not dependent on the Yomis alignment in the range of tested Yomis alignment, and it's also not dependent on the shear exponent. And actually the wind speed uncertainty results are, uh, uh, really show no significant difference with the uncertainties that we obtain with the GAM for a two beam and a cell LiDAR. So essentially, what we can say is that the wind speed model uncertainty is the one of the cup meter used during the calibration in Hofzö. So we are done with the white box uh, methodology. We have our uncertainties on the wind field characteristics. Uh, and now we want to use all those methods uh, for power performance testing and see if they are actually relevant for power performance testing. So power performance testing is uh, 
a standardized uh, field, uh, let's say, international standard exists, AC 6100 12 1. Actually, the last edition is from this year. And this is what I used exactly this method for the mass measurements. But it doesn't exist for nacelle based wind lidars, so I adapted this method to the nacelle based wind lidars. And the results you're going to see here are only for the combined wind induction model, but they also performed that in my thesis for the wind model. And it was applied to the Fabium demonstrator and the for dual mode LIDAR and uh, using the Neurekanger campaign data. I only consider the hub height wind speed. There's no auto equivalent wind speed. And the derived results are the measured power curves, the power curve uncertainties, and the annual energy production. So power curves first, scatter plots. Uh, each dot is a 10 minute period, same data set as you have seen in the linear regressions of wind speed before. Five in demonstrator uh, top left, the deferred dual mode uh, top right, and the mast at the bottom. What we can see is that there is a huge scatter reduction in the power curves using the laser lidars, and that's uh, something we are used to seeing, even with two beam nacelle systems. And that is due to the fact that the nacelle lidars actually follow the turbine uh, motion, yawing motion, so they always measure upstream of the turbine while the mast stays where it is and you have the correlation issues between the mast and the turbine power. And uh, in, in black, you have the reference uh, power curve uh, from the turbine manufacturer. So you have a good match uh, with the two lines and LiDAR system, also with the mast, uh, and um, slight overestimation of wind speed at, uh, at low speed, actually. All these plots are shown in normalized form to ensure confidentiality. Um, so now we bin that power curve using the method of bin, 0 0.5 meters per second wind speed bins, and you make the average of the wind speed, normalized wind speed in these bins and of the power. And that's how the power curve looked like for the four, uh, so the reference power curve from the manufacturer, the cup power curve, and the two nacelle lidars. And visually, we can't really distinguish them. So they seem to, to agree well, each of these systems independently. Uh, they seem to yield the same um, measured power curve. Then we can look at power curve uncertainties. Um, the scatter reduction we have seen in the power curve uh, gives a lower type A uncertainty in the power, and the type A uncertainty is just uh, the statistical uncertainty within each wind speed bin. So as we have scatter reduction with the nacelle LIDARs, we have a lower power uncertainty of type A with the two nacelle LIDAR systems. And the uh, type A uncertainty is actually uh, the shape of the, of the type A uncertainty as a function of wind speed is uh, well reproduced. Uh, the combined uncertainty on the power combines the power uncertainty of type A, type B, also many other terms coming from uh, other instruments for air density measurements that are minor components. And one huge component is a type B wind speed uncertainty. So in this plot, you see the combined, uncertainty, combined power curve uncertainty as a function of wind speed. And what it shows that the uh, five beam and therefore dual modes have lower uh, power curve uncertainty. Wait for it, because the only reason it is smaller is because of the small uh, component called the terrain uncertainty that characterizes the difference that is uh, between the speed measured at a certain distance from the turbine and what the wind speed would be at the turbine position. So scientifically speaking, if you ask me, this term is a little bit silly and quite actually high, but we somehow need to put numbers on that, and that's what the standards did. So you have 3% for the mast, and uh, since I'm taking measurements closer to the turbine, about one rotor diameter, I, use, I chose to use 1% uh, for the nacelle LIDARs, and that's why they give a combined uncertainty that is lower. If you use the same 3%, the combined power current uncertainty from the LIDARs would be slightly higher than the one of the mast. Uh, another comment that the power curve uncertainty is, uh, is highest at uh, wind speed close to rated wind speed, and that is where the turbine, uh, the power curve varies uh, the most. And once you have reached rated wind speed, the power curve uncertainty is pretty low. You just have really minor terms left. All right, now we have our measured power curve, and uh, we need, uh, we can look at annual energy production. The way to do that is to uh, take Rayleigh wind speed distributions. We don't have the wind resource, but we take uh, 
uh, dummy, let's say, distributions of wind speed with different mean wind speed. And we combine that with the power curve to estimate the AP. And the AP in this plot is shows as a percentage of the AP measured by the, as, as, uh, as using the measured power curve from the cup animator. So what you can see on these plots actually with three methods, the five beam at 2.5 rotor diameters with the wind model, the five beam at 2.5 rotor diameters actually with the wind induction model and the actual V infinity fitted characteristic. And above six meters per second, the uh, variation in AP between the three methods with the five beam is less than 2%. And same for the differ. Uh, since we had a, an overestimation of wind speed with um, with a with a five beam demonstrator, we have a slightly slower, smaller uh, AP, it's negative difference, and with a defer, it's the opposite. And the higher the wind speed, then you get close to the rated speed where the turbine power is uh, pretty well defined. So you get very low uh, difference in AP. But uh, two percent might be might seem low, but actually it means a lot of money, and that's uh, why uh, the international standards are. Uh, very important stuff to look at, but two percent is still compared to the wind speed uncertainty a small number. So I'm done with uh, my four parts, and we're going to make some uh, overall conclusions. So the calibration of wind lidars, we have achieved that through the white box methodology for the nested lidar was successfully applied. Actually, along these three years, it has become uh, the preferred technique by the industry. Other people have tried it out and. Uh, uh, adopted this method. The LiDAR line of velocity uncertainty, and that's a takeaway, is very close to reference anemometer uncertainty. Then we have developed method where we say the infinity is found. These V infinities that cannot be measured because of the definition of free stream wind speed, with according to a simple induction model, we can estimate that V infinity. So V infinity is found. And the solution to do that is to combine a uh, wind induction model and LiDAR measurements close to the turbine rotor. And this allows to estimate the free stream wind speed using the model fitting wind field reconstruction. The last part of the power curve measurements, uh, we have shown that nacelle based LiDARs are at least as accurate as metrology masts for performing uh, power curve measurements. Offshore, I would say that the nacelle lidars are likely to replace uh, masts in the future almost systematically. They will be competing with floating wind lidars, but uh, they are definitely cost efficient and, and uh, pretty accurate systems. And the question is if they will be included in the next generation of IC standards. So the future work uh, following that PhD that we can be done is to test uh, this method in complex terrain that was flat site, really easy. We are happy with our results, but we want to try this method in complex terrain. And we have two campaigns in Unity, and the on analysis is ongoing in Hill of Tawi in Scotland and in Ogoye in Croatia. Another part of the future work is the standardization work on the cell lidars for power performance. And there is a new work item proposal in the AEC that, has, that is uh, starting uh, this uh, fall. Then there could be work on the optimization of the nacelle LiDAR trajectory. At which point should they measure upstream of the turbine? Uh, how separated uh, the measurement locations should be? And uh, what are the optimal opening angles of the LiDAR? And to do that, you need a fully implemented, uh, one way to do that is to have a fully implemented LiDAR simulator and have uh, validated CFD tools. Final uh, suggestion for future work is the development of model fitting in field reconstruction for nested LiDAR measurement in wakes. If you have a simple induction model, you can certainly fit the LiDAR measurement in uh, wake conditions to, uh, to the model. And also to test uh, model fitting wind field reconstruction from, for ground-based LiDAR, scanning LiDARs, floating LiDARs. So that's uh, some future work to do. With this, I thank you for your attention, and I think there will be time for questions. And I quite a few people on this slide, but actually not uh, all of those. I would like to thank for the help and uh, collaboration during these three years. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs>